Hello, and welcome to Encounters with Polish Literature, brought to you by the Polish Cultural Institute, New York. I'm David Goldfarb, and I'll be your host. Leopold Tinemund, who lived from 1920 to 1985, is a controversial writer who did his most influential literary work in the mid-1950s when he published Zły, or Evil, one of the great novels of Warsaw in the tradition of Bolesław Prus's monumental 19th century realist novel Lalka, or The Doll. And perhaps its great success owes to its vivid realism, as opposed to socialist realism, which was supposed to represent reality in its revolutionary development, which made it more a kind of idealism, really, than realism, or perhaps socialist classicism, as the Russian writer and critic Andrei Sinyavsky called it. And the novel has influenced contemporary writers, whom we'll discuss with our guest, both in its descriptive realism and in the realism of its distinctive language drawn from mid-20th century Warsaw. Unfortunately, Evil, which is titled The Man with the White Eyes in English, has been out of print in translation for a long time. But you can still find it in libraries, or if you have access to a research library, like a university library or the major library of a large city, you can obtain it through interlibrary loan. Now, that might seem like a hassle, but it's very important that we do it to show the libraries that these books are important and that someone somewhere wants to read them. Otherwise, the libraries may decide to throw them away. Many Polish books that I own in my own collection, like these three later works of Leopold Tillmann, are library discards that I've purchased from used bookstores. As I said, Tillmann was a controversial writer, and we may have preferences for one period or another of his work, but whatever we think, as scholars of literary history and theory, we need the work to be available somewhere so that we can at least read it and decide for ourselves. So don't be afraid to be the first one to check out a book that's been sitting on the shelf for 50 years or more, or to make an interlibrary loan request. And if you just look at a book in the library that hasn't been read for a long time, but don't decide to check it out, return it to the reshelving area in the library and give the librarians a chance to scan it and record that someone was looking at it, which means it's worth keeping. There are also substantial portions of evil which are not translated, and I'll try to read at least one such passage in my own translation. Perhaps there's a publisher out there who might consider the novel ripe for a new or revised version with the full text in place. Before we meet today's guest, I'd like to thank everyone who's been following and supporting Encounters with Polish Literature, especially the many new viewers who joined us and subscribed to the channel and left thoughtful comments after the last episode on Andrzej Sapkowski. Now, in that episode, I confess that fantasy, which is what Sapkowski writes, isn't really my genre. But what I admire about readers of science fiction and fantasy is that they are eager to encounter new things and read eclectically without fear of works that were originally written in other languages and in other times. I haven't traced the source for this, but translator Louis Irabarn, who was my master's thesis advisor, once told me that some of the first English translations from the avant-garde novels of Stanislav Ignacevitkevich or Vitkatsi appeared in a science fiction magazine because sci-fi readers read Vitkatsi as a dystopian futurologist, which may not be too far off. If you like what you hear on the program, click the thumbs up down below. Ring the bell to get notifications about new episodes. Follow the playlist of all of our episodes in the description of the program. Leave a comment if you can, and please click the subscribe button to show the Polish Cultural Institute New York that you are interested and would like to hear more. Remember that your participation reinforces our position in the YouTube search algorithm, and that your active response will help the program rise in the search rankings so that more people can find out about Polish literature it's past and present here on Encounters with Polish and sometimes Ukrainian literature. Speaking of which, be sure to hang on and watch the credits at the end for some recommendations about where you can donate to support Ukraine and Ukrainians fleeing the war. Followers of the program may recall today's guest, Benjamin Paloff, from a very production productive discussion of Vitkatsi way back in episode two of the first season of Encounters early in 2021. 
He is professor of Slavic languages and literatures and of comparative literature at the University of Michigan, where he also directs the Center for Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies, CRIS, and is a faculty affiliate of the Frankel Center for Judaic Studies and the Copernicus Center for Polish Studies. His books include Lost in the Shadow of the Word, Space, Time, and Freedom in Interwar Eastern Europe from Northwestern University Press in 2016, named the 2018 Best Book in Literary Studies by the American Association of Teachers of Slavic and East European Languages, and two poetry collections, and his orchestra from 2015, and The Politics from 2011, both published by Carnegie Mellon University Press. His poems have appeared in a wide range of periodicals, including Boston Review, Conduit, New American Writing, The New Republic, The New York Review of Books, and The Paris Review. He has translated about a dozen books and many shorter literary and theoretical texts from Polish, Czech, Russian, and Yiddish, notably works by Dorota Masłowska, Marek Bienczyk, Richard Weiner, and Yuri Lodman. And he has received grants and fellowships from the Michigan Society of Fellows, the Stanford Humanities Center, and the National Endowment for the Arts, among others. Benjamin, welcome back to the program. Great to see you again. David, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here with you uh, and to be uh, doing another one of these. This is uh, fantastic. So uh, so who was Leopold Tiedemann um, and why, uh, why is he important? Tiedemann is one of the more peculiar figures, I would say, in 20th century Polish letters. He was in, in many ways a, uh, a second-rate writer uh, who happened to write a first-rate novel, a really important novel, uh, in, the, in the mid-1950s. Uh, but he made a, a number of other significant contributions to Polish culture, as well as to American culture, because he spent uh, the last almost 20 years of his life in the United States. He was born into uh, an assimilated and, and, and fairly well-off Jewish family in Warsaw in 1920. And um, although he himself was, was not a practicing Jew and uh, religiously, and in fact, uh, in some ways, uh, not exactly denied, but certainly under, underplayed that aspect of his heritage, even though his family, in fact, was quite, uh, quite influential in the Jewish community in Warsaw. Um, and then <clears throat> he had a rather peripatetic, adventurous uh, life. He he studied in Paris in the 1930s, briefly before the Second World War. He didn't finish his studies. Uh, he, he was spent, studying architecture, if I'm not He was mistaken. studying art studying art and architecture, which is really very evident in his writing. He pays a lot of attention, more so than the vast majority of 20th century novelists, pays a lot of attention to uh, urban design, urban uh, uh, landscapes, uh, clothing, fashion, the kind of exteriors, uh, the aesthetics of the way people behave in um, in modern Europe. And um, then the war broke out and he found himself in uh, Russia, in, that is Soviet occupied uh, Lithuania, where he st- wrote for a communist newspaper um, and uh, eventually found his way on trying to to get to France, eventually found his way in G- to Germany, where using false identity papers, uh, pre- representing himself as French because he was fluent in French, he became essentially a, a, a guest worker in Nazi Germany as a Jew, uh, uh, living under a false identity. Um, and then... Um, uh, returned to uh, Poland after the war, uh, remained in Poland until the 1960s, and then made his way gradually to the United States and emigrated to the United States in 1966 and lived in, in the U.S. until uh, until his death in the 1980s, mid-1980s. So a rather peripatetic uh, life and one that is um, not just uh, peripatetic in the sense of movement, but peripatetic in the sense of adaptation. He would, he would essentially become different uh, figures in different settings, uh, you know, the somewhat foppish um, uh, student from Warsaw in, in Paris becomes the writer for a communist paper in Lithuania, becomes the guest worker in Nazi-occupied Germany, becomes uh, uh, an American arch conservative. In fact, as a, um, a during his time in the United States, he was 
an unapologetically reactionary uh, far right wing um, uh, ideologue. I wouldn't necessarily think of him as a thinker because his his writings on on politics are not really worth serious attention. One other note about Tierman that's actually really quite interesting and important both uh, for his legacy in Poland and for his legacy in the United States is that he was uh, a diehard fan of American jazz, which he discovered during those years or during that year, really, uh, in Paris in the 1930s. He discovers jazz. Uh, it, he, it, he really goes all in for it. He, he establishes, he, he is the founder uh, of Poland's oldest jazz festival, which is, continues to this day now, what, 60 some years, 70, 60, 70 years on. Um, First one uh, was and, in 56 in Sopot. But in addition to that, he's he wrote quite a bit of journalism and the early jazz criticism. I mean, you have to imagine that jazz, which in the 1950s, largely because of Tierman's influence, it becomes hugely present in Polish culture, in Polish film, um, uh, in Polish writing. Uh, it's, it's quite influential. And uh, nevertheless, when jazz arrives in Poland, uh, it's initially treated with a great deal of trepidation and suspicion. And um, and of course, people don't know how to write about it, just as in, in the early days of, of music criticism in the United States with, with jazz or really any new form. There's a kind of lag in the critical establishment understanding how to describe it, how to communicate it, how to um, how to approach it. And so Tierman's quite influential as not just as a promoter of jazz, but uh, really as the person who paves a way for jazz criticism in the Polish language, which becomes a huge thing. Right. So any yeah. basically anyone doing jazz criticism after uh, Tiermond, and, and I, I really can't emphasize this enough for people who are not familiar with the importance of jazz in Polish popular music and in film, uh, it's really, really very present. And Tiermond didn't just promote it, but in fact taught Polish audiences how to read it, how to appreciate it. And and how to react to it, yeah. How to react to it. And that's that's significant. Yeah. Uh, so let's look at this uh, this you know novel of his like you know his great his great period seems to be um, you know the period right after the death of Stalin. It's really before yes. we think of the thaws starting in um, in Poland like fifty six. It's more like fifty four fifty five. Um, so it's uh, it, you know it's an exciting it's an exciting moment. Things are changing. People don't know what to uh, you know what they can say anymore without you know Stalin you know looking over. But the you know of course the authorities are still what they are. Um, and uh, so he's, you know, he's working on his, uh, he's working on a diary, I guess, out of frustration because he, you know, he can't write about the things that he wants to write about. Um, and then suddenly uh, he, uh, he's commissioned to write a novel, write a thriller about hooliganism and bikiniarstvo, uh, <laughs> which is, well, maybe we should explain what bikiniarstvo is. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, and, and that is his novel, uh, Zwi or Evil, or as it's translated into English, uh, The Man with the White Eyes. It was translated, it was published in 55 and translated in 59. So, you know, very, very quickly for a novel of that era. Um, so, uh, so what's your impression of what bikiniarstvo is? <laughs> So Bikinyarstvo, um, this is a, a term referring to the people are Bikinyarstvo. And the words, you can hear it, even if you don't speak Polish, you can hear the word bikini in it. And what you have to imagine, like you have to, for today, especially younger people, you got to go to a, like a vintage clothing store <laughs> and, and, and look at the ties, because that's what it comes down to. In the 1950s, a silk tie tended to be a rather wide by today's standard, of <laughs> stands a rather wide, it's a rather wide and rather short uh, sort of thing that hangs on your chest and becomes, you know, it be, that that's real estate where you can express yourself with colorful patterns, but especially, and you really have to think of like the almost a cliche of 
um, of Middle America 1954 is the the tie with the the hula girl on it. You know, the sort of the the bikini uh, woman who who also who who of course evokes uh, the exoticism of the South Pacific or of the Hawaiian Islands, but also uh, uh, evokes. Um, the association of of bikini atoll and hydrogen bombs and the atomic age, and so the, this is a mark of uh, it, it, an expression of this kind of tie. I'm really talking quite literally about the you know, absolutely this, yes, a that's wide it. silk tie with the little hula girl on it. This is an expression of uh, uh, youth culture because it's not something that's part of uh, of of Polish traditional culture. It's associated with the West because these ties were made and and and, and imported from the West, designed in the West. Um, it uh, evokes irreverence uh, because it is it is as random as it sounds. Uh, it and it also expresses the anxiety of uh, post-war Europe in an in an atomic age and the the kind of almost nihilistic fear that well. The world's going to end any day now, and now we're going to we're going to differentiate ourselves by by essentially wearing this this uh, symbol, which I I can understand that for a contemporary uh, you know twenty twenty two people listening to this will think well how is a bikini tie the same as uh, you know a, a a torn up leather jacket with lots of safety pins in it that says you know punk is dead or something like that it's actually quite the same and. Um, David, what you and I were talking about this uh, uh, elsewhere about uh, I was saying that, you know, the, the perfect companion for for the book is with the man with the white eyes, although there are there are more formal ca- companions such mm. as uh, Isabella Yaroshinska's. Zwi Instruksia Obsługi, you know, the, the an actual book, a book of instructions for reading this an novel. instruction manual. Yeah, an instruction manual, uh, instructions for use. But I think that actually a more a, a more excellent uh companion would be dick hebdige's brief sociological study subculture the meaning of style where he goes into all of the very fine different differentiate differentiations excuse me of of british youth culture in the post-war era and the way they would identify themselves with clothes that would match up to political ideologies uh, musical preferences, uh, regional affiliations, uh, sometimes certain street gangs or underground organizations, which is really the case in this novel, uh, where you have these bikiniages, some of whom are just you know regular street kids dressing their their according to their youth culture and uh, and and messing around, but others who are involved in organized crime. So this is the, the, the way they dress is part of how they identify which gang they're in, which group they're in, just as you would find in post-war America, post-war France or post-war uh, Britain. Yeah. In, in this period, I mean, you know, bikiniarstvo is like it's uh, it's it's equivalent, you know, in the in the official language to hooliganism. I mean, that, you know, bikiniarstvo are considered to be like, you know, like, you know, like hooligans of some sort. And there's there's even um, uh, we discussed one of the you know, there, there are number, a couple of great propaganda films from 1953. Um, maybe we'll look at, look at one in a moment. But one of them, which is not the one that we discussed earlier, it's it's called Oto America. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if you've seen that. That one, but it's it's a it's a film about a, a, an exhibition um, in uh, in Warsaw about America, and it shows you know it's a propaganda right. film, so it shows right. you know racism in America, lynching, uh, crime, and then says you know the you know the youth in America are you know are like you know associated with bikiniarstvo, which sounds really funny because what what do Americans know about bikiniarstvo? Right. And then it shows on a table a number of these ties with you know with the you know, with the uh, with the with the girls on the front, and and another feature of these ties was that uh, they were created by the the firm of uh, Louis Rayard, who uh, invented the bikini. And on the 
back, the logo uh, of Rayard's company was a kind of stylized image of the bikini atoll. Um, so that was that was also you know where the you know where the term is you know comes from. Uh, and they wore like you know a flat caps uh, with like stuffed with newspaper to make them stick out you know uh, better. And uh, um, they would wear uh, you know thick crepe soles um, was another another feature on their shoes. Um, um, and and even though Tillman is very much associated with Bikini Arsfo because he kind of defines it through the novel, um, uh, he is not himself a Bikini Arsh. I mean, he's he's somewhat more more elegant. I mean, he there are certain things about his you know style of dress, but he's thirty five at this point. You know, I yeah. mean, um, in nineteen fifty five when the novel comes out, and uh, so he's you know kind of a little at a distance. And he, you know, I think he's uh, he's made. Do, do you want to do you want to look at uh, show show what some bikiniage look like. Should we uh, show this? I, think, this other? I really think you should show a, a clip because yeah. it will be, uh, if for no other reason that for, than for most Americans and actually for a lot of Poles, younger Poles, this is going to seem weird because it's <laughs> not actually part of the picture that we have of the 1950s in Central Europe. It is a a, a well established subculture, mm -hmm. but there was an active effort by the, the, the authorities to um, to keep representations of this, what you said was hooliganism, but really just generally youth culture was was in, was supposed to be kept out of uh, public media because, you know, they were they were largely afraid that these trends would 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 extend to other places outside of Warsaw, which, of course, they did. There were they didn't really call them Bikinyaje, but there was a version of them in Poznan. There was a version of them in other major cities around Poland. And they would, you know, they would have their own distinctive uniforms and their own distinctive behaviors. The, the ones in Poznan, they were called Eki because they would stand on the corners, Eka mm. in, in German. They had a particular kind of street culture in Poznan that was not exactly the same as in Warsaw. So if you're not familiar with this, you're going to see these images and it's going to seem like a weird mishmash of, in fact, not youth culture, but older American post-war culture. These guys dressed like traveling salesmen. <laughs> Przyjemnie jest trzepiać się buforów, tarasować wejście do tramwaju i śmiać się z konduktora, który prosi o wykupienie biletu. Niech inni nudzą się w szkołach i biją rekordy na nowych budowach. Nas nikt nie nabije w butelkę. Karty, wódka, plugawe dowcipy i lobuzerskie wybryki to się nazywa prawdziwe życie. Człowiek może unikać mydla, ale Tereza i Baczki to legitymacja zachodniej kultury. Czy istnieje coś piękniejszego niż krawat w Gowe Girls a la Hollywood? Buty na pięciocentymetrowej sloninie i skarpetki Sing Sing to dalsze atrybuty męskiej elegancji. Kapelusz systemu Naleśnik świadczy o duszy subtelnej i wrażliwej na piękno. Bikiniarz, joler, chuligan, nazwy różne, ale zjawisko to samo. Bikiniarzy nie wystarczy lekceważyć, trzeba ich otoczyć powszechną pogardą i pędzić precz. Oto fragment zabawy zorganizowanej przez młodzież robotniczą z warszawskiego klubu sportowego Stal w czasie jednego z treningów. Potrafimy dać sobie radę z bikiniarzami i bumelantami. Zrobimy z nich pośmiewisko całej młodzieży pracującej, mówią zetempowcy ze Stali. 
the beginning showed the bikiniage. Uh, they were dressed as such. The one, the one element of the bikiniage, bikiniage uh, uh, outfit that Tirman did did wear was the socks. The uh, the so-called sing striped sing sing socks, so uh, which they mention they mention in the uh, uh, in the film, and then they're chased uh, chased off by the the bikiniage are chased off by the uh, the workers uh, um, you know athletic club in uh, in central Warsaw who are fighting hooliganism and bikiniarstvo, and who are notably in the in the, it's a great it's a great clip, but they're notably the the sporting club they're all wearing they're all identical right they're all wearing uniform. And even as I, you know, we say that the that that the bikiniaji are wearing these these foppish clothes as a as a as a kind as a way of signaling to each other. They're not uniform. They're they're they are they they're within certain fashion parameters. But the whole idea of the bikiniage is self expression. Um, uh, it's it, it, that's always going to be. Uh, um, a bit of a contradiction or a paradox in any youth culture, right? That, that the way you, the way you express your um, countercultural identity is by adopting someone else's cultural script. But that's, but that you know. But nevertheless, the, that it's really striking in the film where you have these, even the bikiniaji who are walking together, they're dressed slightly differently from each other. Whereas the sporting club, they all are dressed identically to each other, and um, and this radical. Uh, uh, self-expression, radical self-individuation was something that Tirman was quite consistently attached to throughout his life. He was not a bikiniage, as you said, he was too old for it. Um, and he generally, uh, uh, I mean, his his attitude toward the bikiniage and especially toward their hooliganism was, if if anything, uh, reactionary, right? He, he, he saw them as, as decadent and you know, marking, he says in his diary a couple times that they marked the fall of civilization, the decline of civilization. But he himself, nevertheless, was noted. He was known in Warsaw in the 50s for his outlandishly stylish uh, dress. Yeah, it meant it meant going to a yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to think of like going to a tailor as a radical gesture. Uh, but uh, right. but at that time, I mean, that's you know, that's that's what one did. Right. I mean, and tailors were you know, it wasn't so elitist to go to a tailor um, in the in the 50s or 60s. So uh, so, you know, having your know, custom made clothes, you know, taking uh, taking pictures from Western magazines and saying, can you make me this jacket? Uh, that was, uh, you know, that was you know, fairly you know common for you know, people of this ilk, uh, you know, wanting to be wanting to be stylish and individual and not to adopt the normal um, the normal uh, uh, you know the official style of dress shall we say you know ironically it's because of that kind of um, the association with wealth that um, that this becomes a, a, a mark of youth subcultures in Europe in the post-war era and it's really it's like a, it's a funny story that there's uh there's an overabundance of um, very uh, traditional cuts of clothing coming out of places like Savile Row in London in the post-war era, and no one's buying those fashions. So they get dumped onto cheap clothing retailers where poor working class youth who have no job mm -hmm. are able to afford for the first time in their lives these ridiculously elegant clothes. And so they buy these ridiculously elegant clothes. They these these guys become known as teddy boys. And that sensibility then filters throughout Europe. This is how the urban youth will will now dress is in the style of an aristocracy from a generation before. Let's get back to back to back to Zwill or or the man with the white eyes. Um, you asked me like before we were you know when we were planning this out. Um, about his contract and things like that, and I, I happen to have those. If you go to the to the diary 1954, which is translated into English recently and published by Northwestern, um, it ends in on April 2nd, 1954. So that's the last the last entry. And his contract, unfortunately, don't have the signature portion of the contract. 
Um, but you know, he, you know, it's a contract with Leopold Termond, um, the author of Zwin, and it's described as a Povich Sensacina, which is, you know, a, a thriller novel. Mm-hmm. Um, he's responsible for producing uh, 18 uh, Arkusha, and Arkush is a, a unit of uh, 40,000 uh, characters. Mm-hmm. Um, and his uh, his deadline is uh, if I'm reading it uh, October first, nineteen fifty four. This is like a hundred and twenty thousand word novel, right? I mean, I, I calculated how much is forty thousand characters approximately times eighteen, and that's that's you know that's like about the you know the length of the novel. Um, so. You know, he's he is somewhere between April 2nd and October 1st. He's got to produce this like monster novel. And mm-hmm. then I also have the uh, certificate of completion. And he was done. This is delightful the way this is written. Uh, you know, the uh, the uh, the blow person, um, you know, uh, um, witnesses that citizen Leopold Termond um, has uh, written for us a uh, for our publisher um, a thriller novel about hooliganism about hooligans in Bikiniage, um, and it's dated uh, May tenth. So it's like just a little over a month to write, you know, 120,000 word novel, which is, you know, strikes me as impressive and feverish. Yes. Although, although he does claim, at least you can never buy, you can never really take people's claims about these things too seriously because we, we often say, yeah, I'm working on it when I don't have anything on paper. I, you know, this, yeah. But, but, but he, he claims that he was already writing it when in earlier in 54, at the beginning of 54, in fact, when he started this diary. And it's worth, I think we really kind of need to contextualize this diary too, yeah. which is an interesting document in itself. And as you said, it's just recently been published in English by Northwestern in, uh, in a new translation, uh, first translation by um, uh, Anita Shelton and, um, and uh, Andrew Vrubel. And um this diary was something that Tierman decided to assign himself um, as a long and dense auto commentary on Warsaw and Poland in the mid 50s when he was not able to write everything he was observing in the kind of hack work journalism that he was um, that he was able to to do and make a living out of. He just at some point in the diary he actually says, that people would assume that because he's not able to um, publish as freely as he would like, that he must be living in some kind of terrible poverty. And he said it's quite the contrary, that he just he writes exactly what he's told to write and that he lives the way he phrases it is, you know, I live not in comfort, but in luxury, which is to say that that he's that materially he was doing quite well uh, relatively but it wasn't what he wanted. It wasn't the thing that he wanted. He wasn't comfortable with it. So he takes. He starts writing this diary, which comes, which is then published uh, subsequently as as Diary 1954. And it's not, you know, it, he covers about three months. But it's a thick book. It's a, uh, you know, three four hundred about four hundred pages long. It's a yeah, solid it's book, but pretty it's, solid. But it's pretty solid. He could he could write. Uh, as you could say, good right at a fairly prodigious pace, but he says at the end of the diary, the end of what we have, he he has this um, afterward where he explains that he ends the diary mid sentence because he received the offer to work on this novel and had every intention of going back the next day and finishing the sentence that he <laughs> ends with. And he just never got around to it because he was so busy with the novel. And you can see how he got how he was so busy because it is a very substantial piece of writing. It's um, it's about 400 pages in English. The English translation expurgates quite a bit. At least 100 pages of the Polish is missing. So it's a it's a really, really big piece of writing. But um, he says that it it essentially took over the work that this that this diary initially was doing, which was to record his observations of social and material reality in Warsaw. And and that's something that the novel does extremely well. It is um, effectively a panorama of Warsaw unofficial life. 
which is to say not socialist realist uh, official propagandistic visions of Warsaw 1955, but a really on the ground look. So what what that has to what people have to be aware of when they when they kind of think about that is that Warsaw 1955 is 10 years after the war. And it still looks in a lot of neighborhoods like the war happened today. Um, a lot of rubble. Um, there's still a lot of, uh, of, of social dysfunction, a lot of unemployment, a major housing crisis, which has been going on. It was already a decade long into the Warsaw housing crisis. And in fact, early in the novel, because um, Tierman has all these little asides where he makes uh, uh, reference to the city. And in fact, in one in some of these passages, uh, as you and I have discussed elsewhere, that there are passages in the Polish where he just addresses the city directly, uh, uh, apostrophically, but um, but those don't make it into the English translation at all. So very typical early in the book, setting the kind of table setting, setting the stage. He says, for example, and this is in David Welsh's translation, for Warsaw in the mid 1950s is a city of strange contrasts. No other city in the world conceals behind its facade so many heartbreaking housing problems, nor so many miracles of ingenuity in making the best of what cramped living space there is, which sounds on the one hand like a really an astute observation, sociological observation, a a kind of glorification or valorization of the Polish or Varsovian spirit, and is at the same time very clearly an acknowledgement of realities that the official, uh, uh, you know, government state-sponsored culture does not want to even acknowledge. So, in writing this novel, this is, as you said, is a thriller. It's basically a crime novel, and it's a really kind of cartoonish crime novel. Right, it's just about petty crime and crime gangs and 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 wayward youth beating people up on the street. There's a lot of that. It's very very episodic. A huge cast of characters, a huge cast of social milieu, and you know, not a huge geographic space. He keeps revisiting the same spaces, so you get to see the different interactions of different people in these spaces. But the the peculiarity of the book is that it's not really as that that's that. Um, publishing agreement you showed suggests it's not inherently a book about hooliganism or bikinage. It's really just a book about uh, vigilantism. It's, there's a mysterious figure who remains mysterious for most of the novel, and he just pops up in these different episodes where crime is taking place, and he is the shadow. He is Batman. He steps in and beats up the bad guys and zips away and becomes a legend in the town. Um, a good analog would be Zorro, and that's not really my analog. It's Tiramans. He mentions Zorro re repeatedly throughout the book um, as kind of the, you know, as the archetype of what this um, evil or the man with the white eyes is this this you know dark figure. You only ever see his eyes, and he looms over crime, and he creates a crisis for the criminal underground. the The thing is, that's a total uh, like that's a that's a stock cheap, pulpy <laughs> premise for a book. What makes it special is that in 1950s Warsaw, you can't write Batman, you can't write The Shadow without acknowledging crime, without acknowledging corruption, without acknowledging unemployment. And uh, and so Tierman does not, he doesn't make a big show of things like, he doesn't dwell on crime. And alcoholism is another yeah, big yeah. feature of that, you know. But it's always it's always there, but not commented on directly. Right. right. He doesn't he doesn't really, you know, he has he has there are lots of scenes in bars and nightclubs, and the people are all drunk. And that's just something that he kind of glances over. But of course, it creates problems for him later on when the authorities realize, oh, wait a second, we published this. <laughs> right. I mean, and it becomes incredibly popular because there are very, very few uh, literary representations of uh, criminality or even like Polish representatives of noir in the four in the 50s. There's plenty of that stuff in the 40s and 30s. Um, Polish readers yeah. couldn't get enough of it. But by the 50s, you're not allowed to write that anymore. And he somehow manages to do it and therefore is able to give 
quite a truthful representation of the disorder and the failure of a city like Warsaw um, in the 1950s, that it just hadn't it, it was not the way the government said it was. It might have been that the you know, that the government you know, imagined that it would be like this, uh, like this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this film. I mean, that it ends yeah. with, uh, you know, there's got to be some worker hero who comes in at the end and, and saves the day, um, you know, from the, the hooligans and, and bikiniage. Uh, it also I mean, there, there's so much realia in it. I mean, it it takes place all within walking distance of uh, uh, Platz Czech, uh, which Czech, is you know, the, the, which the is where uh, it begins. which is where it begins. It's you know three three cross the square, which is where the YMCA was, where where Tiermund himself stayed uh, in Warsaw for a certain period of time, and it's just down the block from Chitelnik, which is the publisher uh, that uh, that published the novel. I mean, it's it's that he it could all be that self contained is, uh, is geographically um, is uh, is is remarkable and and. Yeah, it's like, you know, I mean, you know, we, we think of of him, maybe we, we think of, of Tillman as this is his, his one like, you know, really great novel. Um, and, you know, that it, it seems like he's just recording, you know, recording reality. But somehow he's got he's got his finger on the zeitgeist. I mean, that uh, that, you know, and that's what you know perhaps makes it so popular is that uh, I mean, it, you know, it immediately, you know, is, is selling out and, you know, being exchanged hand to hand. Um, the, uh, you know, that it's almost it's it's almost like a, an accidental talent that's kind of that he's channeling or that, you know, that's kind of being filtered through him, I think. It's funny you say it's remarkable that everything takes place in such a small area of central Warsaw. Um, and and you're right. But, it you know, as as a matter of text, that's true, that that everything kind of is is compact in that it follows uh, a tradition of, frankly, of Warsaw fiction. Uh, you could say the same of the doll by um, right. by Bolesław Proust. And in fact, the geographic settings of that 19th century novel, which is a novel I heartily recommend, it's one of the best novels, I think, in Polish. That's a book where the movements of the main characters around central Warsaw are so specific that in Warsaw today, all over town, you find plaques that this is where Volkulski slept and this is where Volkulski ate. And, and I keep thinking, but he's not real. He never, you know, but the, but there is a, he's, he sort of becomes real through the connection with real places. And I've no doubt that that is part of the um, now decades long residence of this one novel for Polish readers. They've not only been to those places, but for, People who are alive during that time, they saw those people. They know exactly who these people are. They know exactly how they dress. They know exactly why this building was rubble for this long, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that I, I actually find one of the one of the gifts of Tiermond is also one of his one of his uh, biggest um, uh, liabilities as a literary artist is that he has fantastic abilities in sociological and so or, or social observation. And he he notices what people are wearing. He notices how they behave. He notices how they're connected to others, how they inter how people interact across, say, social or professional uh, lines within certain channels, etc. And he lays that out quite meticulously in this book in a way that's quite, that's also rather entertaining. Where he falls short as a writer um, and as a thinker is that he, it, while gifted at sociological observation, is almost completely lacking in so sociological imagination. He can't, um, he doesn't, he can observe how people interact, but he cannot seem to imagine uh, what motivates people individually or within a class, or he has no ability really to understand how the actions of uh, people in one place may affect the opportunities or existence of people in another place. This lack of imagination is all over his later um, political writings. And I'm using that term loosely because I said it really is just pure um, uh, right wing kind of like extreme libertarian ideology. Um, but it's also present in his diary in 54 is that he, he, he speaks a lot about what he sees, but he often falls short 
Um, let, let me let me re- he falls short of a kind of um, ability to see outside of himself. And let me I want to read one quick passage from that from the diary. It's the very end of the diary before his afterward explaining why he ends in mid sentence. So I'm going to read this paragraph that ends in mid sentence. And what I want you to hear is all of the contradictions. He says, I feel strongly moved by acts of faith and honor. Action on impulse awakens hot emotion in me with physical symptoms like a tightness in my throat and burning ears. And yet I adore, and I use this verb with full awareness, propriety. I've even started a novel, and here he's talking about Zwick. I've even started a novel which, if I'm able to finish it, will be an ideological manifesto of propriety, an apotheosis of conventionality, a panegyric to wise convention. The moral category I have the deepest respect for, maybe even love, to the extent that it's possible to love a principle, is loyalty which didn't prevent me from cheating at nearly every opportunity on women I sincerely loved. (laughs) Do I value and respect anything in myself? Yes, the subjective but constantly and minutely tested conviction that, as far as I know, never in my life did I knowingly do harm to anyone. And of course, you can simply ask him a question about the sentence that preceded that. Right. At this point, one can say that the natural lyricism of this kind of sent- of statement is naive, l- like every fundamentalism of self-examination. And yet that's where he cuts off. And it's not even the first and yet in this paragraph. Right. He says one thing and then he says the opposite thing. More or less, he 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 is not able to exteriorize from his own position long enough to see his own contradictions. Um, That's always, I always find this in his writing from from 50, it's not that he went through some radical change in the 60s and became a different kind of person. It's that he just um, found, I think in 1960s American culture, he arrived in the US in 66, he very quickly found in American counterculture an affront to the things he adores, namely propriety, convention. And so, so he, there's always this tension in his writing where you want to, I want to ask, well, what does this write, what does this character think? How does this character feel outside of the stereotype of how they should, according to their type? And he never moves beyond type. One thing I, you know, I think about is that maybe, you know, in some ways, this is what, you know, what, you know, Polish literature needs, though, in the 50s. I mean, that um, that it needs, uh, you know, a, a kind of fiction that doesn't make judgments um, that um, that, uh, you know, sort of is like pure observation and then leaves it to the reader to like draw conclusions. I mean, of course, the characters are kind of, you know, they're they are cartoonish. They are like two dimensional. Um, but ag- again, what was socialist realism? Right. I mean, it was it was uh, also also two dimensional characters. So um, so he's had practice uh, engaging in that in that form. Um, but, you know, he, he's not going to write the, you know, the psychological novel of the 1950s. No, I don't think he'd even be capable of it, honestly. But I think you're absolutely right that this is an important thing that is needed. And he's not the only one writing about these kinds of, um, say, social dysfunctions or um, or the, the, the kind of directionlessness and lack of opportunity among Poland's youth. Um, Mark Huasko is writing during the same period and writes in a very, very different way, very different style. Um, I would say with a great deal more psychological depth. And in fact, he's an angsty writer. So he's very, there's a lot of psychological um, struggle in Huasco that you don't find in Tiermont. There's also, this is also the period uh, that is, that, that sees the rise of the Polish new wave in cinema and, um, and its connection, very direct connection to the so-called black series, the Czarna Seria uh, documentaries being made from almost immediately after the death of Stalin. So even, you know, D- Stalin dies in 53, the thaw uh, uh, officially takes off in 56, but it's already actually in 54, 55, that they're making these documentary films that are about hooliganism, about jazz, about rubble, about uh, housing crisis, et cetera. So you get this whole series of 
of films that are um, increasingly accessible, uh, that are about the failure of the state to acknowledge the, the basic realities that we see. And, and that's why I think that um, one of the writers I really admire from the same era, uh, Gustav Herling Grudzinski, uh, write, writing about Tiermond, whom he did not like even a little, <laughs> compares the diary, the 1954, to The Captive Mind by Czesław Miłosz, which had been released just a couple of years earlier. And the way Herling Grudzinski describes it, if I, if I recall correctly, this is in a, in a private letter, is he says that it is, um, first, he has a very, um, he has a word for Tiermond that I can't repeat on in, in polite conversation. <laughs> um, he says that that's what Tiermond is. But with the Diary of 54, he has produced a document of uh, reality in Poland in the early years of Polish communism that exceeds the captive mind in its truthfulness, even though it is much less than the captive mind in its elegance. And what I think Herling Grzynski means, and I think he's correct, is that Miłosz, in writing The Captive Mind, describes life under totalitarianism almost entirely through the sociological imagination, because he doesn't have observation. He's not there. He's in Paris, right? Whereas Tiermond gives us almost the, the counterpoint. There's another way in which you could actually read The Man with the uh, White Eyes as a companion, not to subculture by Dick Hebditch, but to The Captive Mind. Because the because uh, the uh, uh, Zwi and the Diary of 1954 both throw all of the intellectualization out the window. There is no real conceptualization of the effect of totalitarianism. There's just that's a guy on the street who doesn't have anything to do. Here's another guy on the street who also has nothing to do. Now they're going to do something, and it's not going to be good, right? <laughs> right? Very basic observation of the way people behave. Totally necessary. So I, I really, um, as much as I have critical things to say about Tiermont, I really uh, don't want to uh, diminish the importance of this contribution to Polish letters, both the diary and the, the, the novel. But the novel is also just, the diary is a diary. The novel is a very fast, compelling read. As long as it is, it is yeah. it's a pot boiler. It's totally Damon Runyon. You're reading about, uh, you know, gangsters and street hoodlums. It's great. It seems that in the in the English translation, I mean, I don't know if this is Welsh's uh, decision or uh, probably an editor at Knopf, which published it to, you know, to remove all those apostrophes uh, right. to which are like uh, love letters to Warsaw. I mean, they're yes. beautiful. And, uh, you know, and there's one, you know, to the Warsaw streets and there's one to, you know, uh, you know, Warsaw newspaper editorial boards and, you know, yeah. just, uh, you know, and and they're, you know, it, it's uh you know and they're they're maybe the most culturally specific part so that's one reason i mean we you know we used to hear like for instance miwosh would say if you know if you left a paragraph out of something or other in the english translation you would say oh i left it out because it was too polish i would have to explain too much too many yeah. footnotes uh, of course those are the things that are the most interesting to me but and to you yes. probably as well um because you want to see all the names and the associations and so forth i thought i would read one of these and this is about um, you know, just so people have an idea of what they're missing, you know, if they uh, can't read this in Polish. I mean, maybe it maybe it calls for a new translation or, or you know, I, we can talk about that later. But but here's one. It starts out. Oh, the Warsaw intonation. A big city creates its own dialect, urban slang, whose words and sentences swell with a multitude of meanings available exclusively to the people living in that city. The Warsaw dialect, however, is not defined by phrases, but by intonation. That doesn't mean that the dialect doesn't possess a myriad of words born in the depths of this city. An enormous number of words and phrases exist that were spoken here for the first time and have achieved the rank of exceptional exceptional and irreproducible, ultra precise and ultra funny significance. Nonetheless, it is not expressions and phrases that define the Warsaw dialect. The true Warsaw dialect is intonation. In the little phrase, 
For sure. A native Varsovian can imply a panoply of meanings and moods of which people living in another city or speaking another language do not have and cannot have any idea. In Warsaw, for sure, resounds depending on the neighborhood as a threat or a request with contempt or scorn, hope or doubt, uncertainty or strength of character. The shade of the voice, modulation, accent, this defines the Warsaw dialect. The intonation of a phrase like, you're wasting your breath or never in my life can often contain within itself an expression that substitutes for the worst curse or that implores humility. Intonation defines it. It's kind of a distraction from the, the storyline. So you can see why, you know, the Knopf editor might have like said, well, that stops the action when he you know just speaks to Warsaw. But it's, you know, that's also what the novel is about. It's not just a pot boiler. That's the thing is, I, you know, it stops the action, but I don't need the action. <laughs> I've read this. There are a billion versions of this story. I just compare, you know, I was, like I said, the, the Batman you know, the shadow, and the shadow, Batman and... Zorro. It's the same thing. It's just a, you know, a vigilante fantasy. Um, and it's a very, it's a particular kind of vigilante, you know, kind of, um, uh, <clears throat> frankly, white male libertarian <laughs> Avenger fantasy. To me, this is what the novel's about. And it also helps draw a line between Tierman and who I would say is his, his most um, readily uh, available uh uh, contemporary inheritors, uh, even though I, you know, they both disagree with him radically when it comes to um, to uh, politics. And and I would say that they also have artistic value that that extends well beyond what Tierman offered. And I'm thinking of people like uh, Dorota Maswolska and um, uh, Michal Witkowski. Uh, these are writers who also depict in the post-communist era the otherwise mainstream neglected countercultures of Wars of Poland in general, but especially of Warsaw, the particularity of Warsaw characters and their uh their intonations, their language. I think Maswowska has an absolutely extraordinary uh ear for this kind of um uh language. And and Zwi also, for those who are willing to to really dig into the language, it is a wonderful catalog of phrases and uh, the living language of Warsaw in the 1950s. Uh, some of that comes through in the translation, but it's mostly suggested because the translation instead gives you things like, you know, that a kind of generic noir uh, language from the from the 40s. There's more specificity to it, I think, in the Polish. But um, but I would at the very least, I would want a passage like this in the English so that readers understand, oh, this is and it this is someone addressing the city in the whole novel, not just in these little passages. I know, uh, you know, David Welsh, the translator, who also translated uh, Lalka, uh, the doll for, you know, mm -hmm. for that matter, the other other previous major novel of Warsaw. Um, he was your predecessor at the University of Michigan. Uh, what, what, what can you say? Do you know very much about uh, this was a while back before your yeah. time? So what do, what do you know about David Welsh? And maybe you can say a few words about uh, the, the long legacy of literary translation, especially in Slavic at, uh, at Michigan. It's a really great place to be for that. It is a great place to be for that. And that's more and, and whatever modest contribution I've made to that legacy has been a, an enormous privilege for me. Um, I have very little to say about Professor Welsh beyond what you just said, because he was a professor here in the 1950s. Um, there have been some distinct kind of phases of um, this university's participation in the translation and publishing of literature from Central and Eastern Europe, it goes pretty far back to the 50s with Welsh translating these major texts and doing so rather well. And um, uh, and then and then he leaves. And then there's a whole era of of others in the 60s that includes people like Ladislav Mateka and uh, Carl, Carl and Ellen Dea Proffer, uh, Joseph Brodsky, who comes here uh, and is a professor, not just in this department, but in fact, in this space. This is this was Brodsky's office. Um, uh, uh, and then uh, Bogdana Carpenter uh, and John Carpenter as as translators and promoters of Zbigniew Herbert, um, a major Polish poet. 
And and now there is a, a new era, as it were. So it's not just, you know, I can't really say much about uh, Welsh personally. I certainly never met him. He's before my time. But uh, the question of, you know, legacy is something we talk about in somewhat um, vague and often romantic terms. But here it's institutionally very specific, is that people who specialize in literature are, um, if not expected, is certainly welcome to engage in the production of that literature. Uh, and, and not every academic institution supports that kind of work the way Michigan uh, historically has and continues to do. Uh, and Welsh represents a, a, a key point in that legacy. I think we all know institutions where they, you know, they'll uh, tell you as a young literary scholar, don't translate. You'll never get tenure for that. Yes. And then those people end up, you know, being, you know if they have a desire to translate, they do it after they get tenure or in their retirement or uh, something like that. But, you know, maybe they could have, you know, Often, you know, in our field in Polish, I mean, um, certainly uh, what we the first thing we need before we can do criticism in English are translations so that we have readers uh, who Absolutely. are familiar with the text and can be interested in criticism in uh, in our own native language that we write uh, in a scholarly and creative way. Um, one one question is, uh, is, uh, you know, the. Uh, uh, the Warsaw novel that uh, of Maswalska's that uh, that is often you know, pointed to would be um, Pav Krulove. Uh, are there any plans to translate it? I've been Maswalska's translator since uh, well for, for throughout her career. Um, I've proposed this novel to a number of publishers. They don't want to touch it. Um, uh, it it's it sounds a little too far out there because it, and it's compositionally the too far out there because this is a novel Pav Krulove or where the queen's peacock um it's a it's a it's a the, the the title has more valence than that but that's the most literal translation is uh it's a novel that's written in um semi in in rhythmic semi rhyming prose it's written in hip hop meter so um uh and it, and it follows a kind of hip hop subculture, youth subculture in Praga, uh, which is the eastern uh, part of downtown Warsaw on the other side of on the east side of of the Wisła River. So it's it is, again, highly specific to a, a geographic location, a very specific subculture and and absorbing the, the language of that subculture. But what Maswowska does that Tierman really is not doesn't do or is perhaps not capable of is um, all of the different language influences on a writer like Maswowska then get put through the Maswowska blender and it comes out as Maswowska as this highly stylized, really like very, very stylized um, uh, performative text where the style is a key character in the text. Uh, so I, I have translated samples of this. I've translated portions of it and I've, I've actually shared some portions at, at um, readings and talks with Maswoska in the United States. Uh, if you want to hear me um, uh, do a, an excerpt, actually Maswoska and I both do an excerpt from the book. You can find it in, on, on YouTube where she and I uh, did a presentation at Indiana University uh, just a few days before the pandemic forced a total lockdown. So um, it was it was one of the very last events I did publicly before the pandemic began. So their absolute enthusiasm for doing the work on this book, I think it's a, an extraordinary novel. It won the Nikkei Prize, Poland's highest literary honor. But um, but one has to always overcome the hurdle of uh, of American publishers who are reluctant to take on something that is so, as, as Miłosz might say, aż nad to polski, too Polish, right? I don't, I actually think that this is a, that, that, um, that this is a highly adaptive novel that in fact, the, the so the plan that Dorota, that I, I hatched with Dorota was to reset the entire novel in Queens instead of being in a kind of declasse Warsaw it's in Declasse, New York. Um, 
And uh, and we were having a lot of fun playing around with that idea. Uh, Better but, hurry up while Queens is still déclassé. That uh, I know, exactly. <laughs> real estate is kind of constantly expanding in New York. Well, this is one of those <laughs> things where I can say I don't do this a lot, but I'll I'll do it here if any uh, if anyone if any daring editor who wants to really make something special in the translation. Uh, hears this and wants to take it on. This is a this is a really important novel in 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 Europe, and I think would be a, a lot of fun in in um, English. Uh, oddly enough, the most recent book of of Dorotos that I translated was her novel that's set in a dream version of the United States, because I think in part because it makes it a little more accessible. What's the title? Honey, I killed the cats. Let's pick up with that sometime next year. Let's do an episode on uh, Dorota Maslowska. That would be great. All right. Well, it's great having you here again and looking forward to sometime next year. We'll do the Maslowski episode. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, David. It's always a pleasure to, to see you and to speak with you. Don't go away. Please subscribe and click the bell to receive notifications about new videos from the Polish Cultural Institute, New York. Go to the Polish Cultural Institute's website linked in the description below to see a full schedule of upcoming episodes. Stay tuned for the credits for some recommendations about how you can support humanitarian aid for Ukraine and for Ukrainians fleeing the war in their country. I'd like to thank all the people who helped make the series possible. The Polish Cultural Institute New York sponsors our program. Bartek Remisko, head of humanities and literature of the Polish Cultural Institute New York, suggested this series and is our executive producer. My fellow producer, Natalia Iudin, handles all the video editing, technical, and aesthetic aspects of this production. Claudia Ofwana Draber, head of communications at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, keeps us all informed about upcoming episodes of Encounters with Polish Literature and other events organized by the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Thank you all for listening and reading along with us. Let's meet again in a month when Katarzyna Zechenter from the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at University College London will join me to discuss the new wave in Polish poetry from the generation of 1968 through the Solidarity Period, combining a certain neoclassical dedication to poetic form, political engagement, and the language of everyday life in works by poets like Adam Zagajewski, Ewa Lipska, Stanisław Barańczak, and more. See you then.